All right, all right. It's good to see everybody. Yes. Hope everybody's doing well. I want yes. everybody to look to your left, be your neighbor, at air high five. Hey, air high five. Look to the other side and give them also an air high five. Those that are listening, I hope you are doing the same. Um, so I know last time I spoke, I was here in November, and we just finished up uh, a series called The Right Structure, right? And, and in that series, we talked about what it means to have the right structure in God and four ways to keep the right structure. And then I gave a sermon on biblical, the right structure of Bible heroes, right? And so today, you know, as, as when I was giving you the title of the message, I was thinking all week, so anytime I'm preparing to speak, I ask God, Lord, show me all week. Like, what is it that you want me to speak? Because it's, it's about you. It's not about me. I'm just the vessel that he's chosen to use. And so I'm thankful for that opportunity, Glenn. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I appreciate it. Because I want to be a blessing to you all. And so as I prayed and prepared for today's message, we're going to start a new series. And it's going to be called Fantastic Faith. Okay. Right? And Fantastic Four is a, is a play on the, the, the Marvel comic. Right? you got four parts of it. So you have four parts of this series. Um, Fantastic Faith, today's message is part one. We're going to do an introductory to today's message. And during this, this series, we're going to answer questions such as, what is faith, right? How do we apply faith? What is God's view on faith, right? Because this world has its definition of what faith is, but God also has his definition of what faith is. And so the, the world defines faith as it defines faith as a secure trust in someone or something, right? And faith is a, is a topic that's often discussed, and it's not just limited to the Christian faith. You see some people say they can't really articulate it. They describe it as a hunch or a strong belief. But we're going to look into the Bible today and see exactly what it has to say about faith. All right, there's some often, I give you guys a lot of quotes as I begin my message because I like to, to open you to different uh, you know, statements on, on faith and, you know, outside of the description I was looking at, right? And so one of the uh, quotes that I saw talked about faith, it says, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Mm -hmm. Another one says, faith is what, faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Another one says, faith is not belief without proof, but it is trust without reservation. The principal part of faith is patience. And then I came up with one. I figured I might as well come up with one. Faith is the muscle that we only grow when we use it in the gym called life. So the Bible, if you will, is, uh, faith is the muscle that we use and that only grows when we exercise it in the gym called life. Uh, so if you would, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Well, Hebrews chapter 11. And some people know this as the faith chapter. Right? Because it speaks about so many men and women in scripture who often exercise their faith. Right? And we see it. And a lot of times we think that people in the Bible, men and women in the Bible, they were somehow different than us. That's not true. They came from the dust of the ground just like we came from the dust of the ground. They had doubts. They had fears. They had anxiety. Right? The same way that you and I experience it. And it doesn't mean that they're any different or that God loves them any more than he loves us. He loves us all the same. The Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons and that to one to which he'll do it, he'll do it for each and every one of us. Right? So we sometimes we see, I like to remind people of that because sometimes we see these supernatural events take place and we think, well, that's only limited to the scripture. That doesn't apply. No. The Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he'll do it. So what does the scripture define faith as? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So as today's message progresses, I'm going to talk to you about different types of faith, right? And you see that it says the substance of things hoped for. When something, there's substance, that means that it's tangible, right? That means that you can touch it. That means that it's not just esoteric or it's not just out there that, where you can't really feel it. It means that it's actually something that you can touch. The table that's in front of you, the chair that you're sitting on, that is a substance, right? And then it goes on to say the evidence of things not seen, right? So you all have faith and probably didn't even realize it. When you sit down in the chair that you sit down in, you didn't test the legs to see if it worked. You just sat down. Why? Because you have faith that it's going to work. It's going to hold you up. 
didn't even think twice about it. I know I don't, right? Just go there, sit down, so be it, right? Because you have faith. And that's the same way God expects us to exercise faith in him, right? So let's look at verse two. It says, for it, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the world were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaking. And then verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Right there we see in verse 6, what is God's perspective on faith? Does God require us to have faith? Well, clearly he does. He shows us right here. It's impossible to please me, right? This is what God is saying. It's impossible to please me if you do not have faith, right? It is a prerequisite to have a relationship with God because he expects us to have a tremendous amount of faith. I remember one time when I was about I was a teenager and my brother and I, my twin brother and I, we, we were going to the park to play some basketball. Grew up in kind of a... a Challenging neighborhood. And I remember heading to the park, you know, thinking, okay, I'm gonna play some, play some basketball against some older kids. I don't know how this is gonna work out, right? And who knows how it's gonna be. And next thing you know, probably about 20, about 10, 15 minutes into the walk, I heard this ball just dribbling, dribbling, dribbling. And I looked back and it was my oldest brother. And I remember when I saw him, I had so much, I felt so much better, right? Because my big brother was there. I knew no matter what situation happened at the park, I was going to be okay. I had faith in my brother, right? I didn't, I didn't necessarily voice it or articulate it to my twin brother as we walked. But as soon as I heard the ball bounce and I saw him, he's probably about 30 yards behind me. When I saw him, I said, okay, everything's fine. No matter what happens at the park, my big brother said, we good. No worries, right? And that's how God is. As long as we know, we hear him, everything's going to be, be okay. And it's challenging. And, and one of the reasons that I really wanted to speak about faith is we live in a time period where people are losing their faith, right? People are questioning things that are fundamental parts of the, of the Christian faith. And it's, it's not to say that you, de- you never have periods of doubt. We all do, right? And that's okay. And you can tell God that. But the thing, the key is to never stop believing, never quit. And that's, that's what's really been in my spirit is because there are challenges that arise. There are obstacles that come as life progresses, right? It could be a health issue. It could be a relationship issue. It could be financial circumstances that may not be exactly how you like. Whatever it may be, you're going to have a challenge. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. He said, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. And if we follow in the footsteps of the one who overcame, we'll overcome it as well. So I want to encourage those who are here. I want to encourage those who are listening as well. Don't give up. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. That's all the enemy wants you to do is to give up, to get frustrated, to stop. No, don't do it. Get your second win. Get your third win. To use a sports now. Keep going. Don't give up. I'll give you guys a story. A father and his young daughter stood in the rain outside of a local community store. And as they stood there, it began to rain profusely. The young daughter said to her father, let's go through the rain. And the father said, but we'll get wet. The young girl said, that's not what you said to mom this morning. And the father stood there confused because he didn't know exactly what the young daughter was talking about. And then the little girl said, well, well dad, you told mom if, we, if she can get through cancer, we can get through anything. And a lot of people who heard the conversation, they stood there amazed. And the father and daughter began to run through the rain. The moral of the story is, have childlike faith and believe every word that comes from your father. Mm -hmm. She believed. She believed in what her her father said. Right? And sometimes we have to have faith like children. Take it back to the fundamentals, the elementary stage. She heard her father utter the words to her mother, if we can get through this, we can get through anything. And she applied that principle to something as simple as playing in the rain. She didn't think I was going to get wet. She took him for every single word that he said. She took it for what it was. And that's how God expects us to. He's given us promises in his word. My favorite Bible verse, you hear me say it, Romans 8, 28. 
All things work together for good, those who love God. Yeah. And are called according to his purpose. To me, that says no matter how bad it gets, I'm gonna make it through. All things. One of the tips that I gave you last time when we spoke about keeping the right structure, it was speaking the word of God. Sometimes you gotta encourage yourself. If you're by yourself right now, if you're in isolation because of COVID, if, if whatever situation may be, speak the promises of God. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Right? Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? Philippians 4, 19, I was quoting this one the other day. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. To be transparent, one of the reasons I did it is because I'm an entrepreneur. Right? And sometimes, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and, and, and you know about entrepreneur life, you can have great months and not some great months. Right? But God will supply. He always does. He always will. One of the things I think about is we think about the very nature of God. I had a discussion this past week with a friend of mine. We were talking about the attributes of God. And he, and he asked me certain questions about if well, God knows this and, and why does he allow this. And, and I thought about it. God can't do anything that's inconsistent with his character. Right? And one of the attributes of God is that he is, in, he is omniscient. Right? The word omni means all. The word scient is a short version of the word scienter, where we get the word science or knowledge. God has all knowledge, right? And so God has, God has all knowledge. That means that he is infinite in nature, meaning there is no end to his knowledge. There is no end to any of his attributes. That's very difficult for us to, to understand because we are finite. But God is infinite, or what we say is infinite. And so when you talk about having faith and trust in God, think about the very attributes of God. God is infinite in that. He's infinite in mercy and love and wisdom, right? We are made in God's image, right? But it doesn't matter how smart you may be, right? There are a lot of skeptics out there now. Think about it. The smartest person alive, you can be 10 times smarter than Albert Einstein. You still have a finite amount of knowledge, right? There's no counsel of wisdom against God. No matter how, how wise or what belief you believe you may have that's contrary to the word of God, it still doesn't go against it. And that's one of the things I want you guys to think about. If you would, please turn with me with your, in your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. And you know Daniel's also one of my favorite books. <laughs> I think you can guess why. <laughs> I think there's a book called David. Uh, <laughs> 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 that's not the inner. No. Uh, I'm joking. My, brother, my, my brother's name is David. So we often joke about which, which story is greater, Daniel's line, you know, uh, David's line. <coughs> but nonetheless, so when I, when I spoke earlier about different types of faith, right? This is a, it's a type of faith, and I, and I gave it this title, right? And, and, and it's not. It's, it's biblical because it's in there. The NIV uses the words even if. But you'll see in a second what I mean. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. And when you get there, say, God is good. God is good. All right, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king at the time, right? The Bible says, the king made an image of gold whose height was three, core, three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Duran in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all rulers of the province to come to dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set the king, the king had set up. So to set the stage, Nebuchadnezzar is the king at the time, right? He has a tremendous amount of power. And he sets up an image, an image to which you will see shortly, he wants people to bow down to. He wants people to, to worship. Now, of course, we know that's contrary to God's word. It breaks the first commandment. That's why I know the gods before me, right? And also the second one, it says, you should not make him see a graven image. Um, in a different context. Verse three, then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the provinces, right, the important people, were gathered together into the dedication of the image, 
that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then, and Herod cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people of nations and languages, that at the time when you hear the sound of the, of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, the psaltery, which it goes on to say, and all the kinds of music, y'all, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Right? Let's go, let's drop down to verse 11. Then it says, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And there were three certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which you have set before them. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto him, It is true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Verse 15, now if you be ready, that at which time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the psaltery, so on and so forth, you shall fall down and worship the image which I have made. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is it that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Think about this. Not only did he set up the rule of law, when you hear the music, you shall worship this golden image. But he said, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. You guys, I know you don't do that, but I'm going to give you another chance. When you hear it again, when you hear the music, play it. Not out of worship image. Just in case it was a mistake the first time, I'll give you a pass, right? A moment. Right? So he sets the stage. And then verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to King, of Neb Neb to King Nebuchadnezzar, we are careful not to answer you in this matter. 17 says, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. Now imagine this. Last time when I was here, we spoke about the faith that Elijah had when he called down fire from heaven. In this particular instance, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a tremendous amount of faith in God. They believe. In verse 17, it says, if it be so. Another translation says, even if... And this is what I call even if faith. Even if God doesn't answer my prayer. Even if I don't get the promotion in my job. Even if I don't get married at a certain age. Even if my loved one passes away. Will I still believe? Even if. Many of us in our day-to-day -day life won't come and have an encounter like this. Right? Where we, our lives are really put on the line. Where we can be killed. That's a concept that's really foreign to us in this country, thankfully. But there are places on this earth where you name the name of Christ, you could lose your life. There are places where the Bible is outlawed and you can't have it. You risk your life. But these three Hebrew boys, they display what I call even if faith. Imagine that. I could lose my life and be thrown into a furnace. Not just lose your life, but burn alive at that. And they say, even if, even if God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to do it. And verse 18 says, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they're saying, even if he don't, we're still not going to. That's faith. That's faith. That's faith. It takes time to get to that point. But these, these, these men say, we're not doing it. And I'll be honest, I don't know if I'm at that point where I would say that. I would like to be. Mm -hmm. And the question that I ask you, that's rhetorical in nature, are you? Are you willing to lose your life? That's a hard one. That's a hard one. But they display even if faith. Let's go to verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury in the form of his vision. And in, in the form of his vision was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego there. Therefore he spake and commanded that, the, that the, they should heat the furnace 
seven times hotter than before. So now he's even more upset. He was what they call big man. <laughs> so not only did I give you a second chance to do right, we're gonna forget the first time, but I'll give you a second chance. And then you're still refusing? Okay, make it seven times hotter. See if that'll change your mind. How dare they not worship the same image as men? How dare they not? Foolishness, right? And verse 20 says, and he commanded the most mighty men that were there in his army to bind the three Hebrew boys and to cast them into the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hats and their ornaments and were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. There, verse 22 says, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of fire slew those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So it was so hot that the men who were ordered to throw him in there were burned themselves. Uh-oh, this is getting interesting. This is getting interesting. Verse 23 says, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. God, I thought you were faithful. I thought, you, I thought you had my back. It was just talk at first, right? Oh, I'm not bowing down to them. No, 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 no. Okay, God, come save me. All right, we see it in the movies, right? The good person always comes in at the end. They could have renounced their faith, but they did. Then it says in verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and he rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men into the fire? They answered and said unto the king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So imagine that. You see how you feel right now? The air conditioned room, you're comfortable. I'm sure that's how they felt at that moment. Guess who showed up? The big brothers. Showed up. They had no heart, no, no, no harm, no hurt. He was right there with them. Then verse 26 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. Verse 27, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head hurt. Neither were their coats changed or the smell of fire had passed on them. That's why I said the way you feel now is how they felt. Meaning physically now, there was no harm, no, no discomfort. They probably looked better before they went in. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and had changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own. God rewarded their faith. He rewarded their faith. Not only did he save their lives, which in and of itself would be amazing, but he had the, the king now with the king now said, you worship no other God but your own. That's amazing. It's converted, if you will. The king went from worship this image at the sound of the music. Oh, you're not going to do it? Okay, I'll give you a second chance. Oh, you're not going to do it? Make it seven times hotter. Oh, I see a fourth man in there. So you know what? I give up. No, you don't worship anyone else but your God. That's quite the change in circumstances, I would say. They displayed even if faith. The takeaways from this story, the three Hebrew boys, they were obedient even in the face of death. They continued their disobedience even after being threatened. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. King, he said, an unjust law is no law at all. If there's a law, if there's legislation that's passed that is contrary to the word of God, don't obey it. Easier said than done, I know, but none the same. It's still the same principle that applies. And their faith in God led the king even to believe. And not only that, they were eventually promoted. 
That's amazing. That's even if faith. If you would, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. We have another type of faith. And when you get there, say, I love you, Lord. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. I didn't hear a lot of love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Okay, all right. Okay. Love you, Lord. Hey. <laughs> verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, behold, here I am. Now, if you realize, some of, many of you know, Abraham was married to a woman named Sarah. Right? And for many years, they didn't um, bear a child. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Sarah was 90 years old by the time that she had a child. His name was Isaac. Right? So you may hear people say, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this was their only son together. And it took him, it took uh, a long time for them to receive the promise of God. Right. And so you would think I waited all my life. Right. This is Sarah speaking. Right. I waited all my life to have a child. I'm, I'm excited. Right? I'm joyful. Nothing is going to happen to this child. Except for let's go to verse two. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell thee of. So can you imagine that? Abraham telling his wife, I know we waited a long time for a child. And that child that we've been praying about, that child that we've been fasting for, we, we got we to gotta offer him up. Can you imagine the conversation they had, pillow talk? Hey, babe, <laughs> just want to let you know. You know, uh, our son, yeah, he may not be around too much longer. God was testing Abraham at this point. This is called committed faith. Verse 3 says, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. I believe that there are no idle words in the Bible. Verse 3 didn't say, and Abraham got up after he hit his alarm clock. It didn't say that he got up after he contemplated, did I really hear from God? Nah, God didn't say that. I didn't know how, how long we waited for our, for our son. It didn't say he waited until noon day. It says that he rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, carried the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place that God had told him. He didn't delay. Abraham knew without a shadow of a doubt, hey, I, I heard from God. I heard from God. It doesn't quite make sense, but I heard from him. And many of you may be saying the same thing. I know God told me to move to a different city. I, I, I know he told me that. I, I know he told me to apply for the job, even though I'm not qualified. Right? I, I know he told me to forgive that person that hurt me. I don't think they deserve to see me. Committed faith. It's not easy to do. But nonetheless, it's committed faith. Thank you. And so we see in scripture, verse five, and Abraham said unto his, I'm sorry, verse four. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse five. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide here with the donkey, and I will go with the yonder and worship and come unto you again. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood off the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife and they both went together. So picture this, Abraham and Isaac are walking side by side. The scripture doesn't detail exactly how old Isaac is at this point, but you can gather he's old enough to realize what's going on. He's not a, he's not a, a child, uh, an infant. Right? So he's aware something is going on. Verse 7, and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, 
He said, here I am. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So he's old enough. He realizes something goes on. I know that when they have a burnt offering right here, or uh, when they lay the wood right here, something usually dies. But where is it? Because uh, it's just me and you here. Right? Like this This is a, a tough one. I, Isaac doesn't realize that you're supposed to be. Verse 8, he says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Verse 9, and they came to the place which God had told of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Okay, so now something, why, why, why are you tying my hands? What's going on? I, I can't do the burnt offering, right? And Abraham all the while is saying, I know God told me. I know God told me. What if Abraham had said, you know what? This is crazy. What am I tying my son up? The son I prayed for so much the son that my wife really, really, she wanted to pick me on this burnt offering, she, on, this, on this altar, because she knew what was going on. Will you stop even after things go a little different than according to plan? Abraham did he had committed to it. Then verse 10, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. What caught my eye is, how many times did he have to call Abraham's name? Two times. Right? When you're, when, you're, when you're young and your mom says, come inside the house. She usually says it twice because you didn't do it the first time. You were so engrossed in what you were doing that I had to repeat the command, right? And that's what Abraham was. He was so committed. The angel had to call his name twice. I know if I heard an angel's voice, it's only going to take one time. <laughs> <laughs> but here he said his name twice. Abraham, Abraham. Why? Because he was committed. He knew he heard from God. Verse 12, and he said, lay not thy hand upon the son, not to do anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou only that he is your only son, and you withhold not him from me. Verse 13 says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him came a ram in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a sacrifice instead of his son. God will supply I know it may not feel like it, it may not look like it, it may not sound like it. God will supply. You can never win a race that you quit. You can never win a race that you quit. I love sports, right? So I often equate sports analogies to my faith. And if you remember, right, Mike Tyson was a, was a, was a brutal heavyweight. He was knocking everybody out. And he won early in one of his title defenses. He fought a guy named Buster Douglas. Buster Douglas was an up-and-coming boxer. He wasn't as good as Mike Tyson. And if they had fought 100 days in a row, Mike Tyson would have won. 99 days in a row. The problem for Mike Tyson is they fought on that 100th day, which happened to be their only fight. And Buster Douglas outlasted Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas got knocked out. He got back up. Everyone else that Mike Tyson knocked out, they didn't get back up. And he told, he said, if I, if I just don't quit, I, there's still a possibility I can win. There's no guarantee, but it's a possibility. I, but if I give up, I'm surely, I'm surely not going to have an opportunity. That's all Satan wants to do. He wants to knock you down and wants you to stay down. And if you stay down, you surely can't win. But if you get up, then you got a chance. And you got the opportunity. That's when Big Brother shows up. Satan wants you to get out of the fight. I was not sure you don't want to do that. <laughs> Will you surely die if you eat that fruit? You don't have to forgive him. You don't have to forgive her. They hurt you. Nah. Look down upon them. They're not that. They're not as good as you. Those are lies from the enemy. He often uses those lies to trick and manipulate. 
and deceived. Look at what's going on in the world right now. The Bible is very clear that the, the world is Satan's. Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall like light. And where did he go? Here on earth. God will soon restore his kingdom and set up a kingdom that will never end. But right now, this is Satan's world. I know that seems it's contrary to popular teaching, but it's the truth. Not everything in the world is bad, but a lot of it is. And people often look at those things that are bad and believe that because they're going on, oh, they can't be God's Remember earlier when I said God is infinite in knowledge. He uses everything according to a plan. We have a, a, a character in the basketball camp. A lot of times we, we tell the kids at our camp to do something. And they fight with other kids and they fuss uh, about a basketball or about whatever it may be. And I tell them to stop. I tell them to do this, do that. Because I know how I want the camp to go. I know how it's going to go from start to finish. If they would just stop fighting for this basketball that's right here, it's 10 of them over there. <laughs> and God knows how we're going to go from start to finish. There's nothing that catches God off guard or by surprise. The Bible says the earth is God's footstool. It's not like God is like, oh my God, it's totally going on down there. Oh my God, that stock price dropped. Oh my God, they're dealing with this. I never I could have anticipated that these little bitty human beings who are like ants in my sight could be doing something that could catch me off guard. Obviously, he knew. From the very beginning, he knows how it's going to play out. And in the end, we win. Amen. But think about this. Your only son you had with your wife was about to be sacrificed. And, and the angel of the Lord had to call his name, not once, but twice. And early in the, in the chapter, we saw that it says early in the morning, he got up. He didn't go back and forth with God. God, are you sure? Is there something else? I mean, you can give me 10 rounds right here. We don't got to go through this, God. Oh, we got to. Come on, we don't got to do this. God, you sure you told me to leave this job? I worked hard. It took me, it took me 10 months to get this. I went to school four years for this job. You sure? You sure you're telling me? You, you, you sure you're telling me to keep distance between me and my family and doing things that are not? You sure you you sure you're saying that? Commit. Early in the morning, he got it. And this comes with practice. This comes with, over time, developing and strengthening your faith. Earlier, we talked about faith being like a muscle. You exercise it as you go to the gym. Right? If your muscles are never exercised, they never grow. There's no, there's no resistance. There's nothing to stop it. And life is a gym, and we have to exercise it. If you would, please turn with me to Luke chapter 5, verse 17. This is another type of faith. We have even the even if faith with the three Hebrew boys. We have the committed faith when Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And we have another type of faith. Luke chapter 5. When you get there, say he's almost done. Oh Keep on going, but not quite there. <laughs> he's, he's almost there. He's nearing the home stretch. We want you to preach until there's nothing left. <laughs> nothing left. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Luke chapter five. Now I don't know about you guys, but I love my group of friends and my people. Many of them listening to me, you know, right now, they online. I appreciate it. They, they got my back. Right? <laughs> Think about those two or three people you know that just got your back no matter what. Yes. They with you. Right? Mm -hmm. So to set the stage in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus is out and he's teaching and preaching, right? Surprise, surprise, right? Jesus is out. <laughs> in the streets. Right? <laughs> verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And verse 18 says, And behold, men brought in a bed, a bed, men 
brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before Christ. These men believe. So imagine to set the stage, there's a big crowd. Jesus is teaching. Y'all heard about that man on that Jesus? Like he, he could be miracles, man. He's he a little different. You know what I mean? He ain't like everybody else. Like he, every time he comes around, people get healed. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to go check him out. And the guy who's paralyzed has his friends. And he's like, hey, I don't know. I mean, we can probably, this is equivalent to what we probably would say a concert or something, right? Like, are y'all going over to here? Jesus, speak. Because he, he's supposed to do some amazing things. Y'all heard about that? And he's like, well, I'm paralyzed. How am I going to go and get over there? And they were met with resistance. And verse 19 says, and when they could not find a way that they may bring him in because of the multitude, they went on the housetop. This is called proactive faith. And even if faith, committed faith, proactive faith. They were met with resistance, but said, you know what, hold on, we're going to be proactive. We can't get him in through here. I think that's it. Hey, maybe we can get a ladder and go on top of the roof. That'll, that, that'll get him in. Let's get him in. Because they could have easily said, so many people, man. People back. Okay. They, they, they say Jesus will be back on the 25th. We'll, we'll, we'll come back again. <laughs> he should be back around Christmas time, right? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't just stop because they were met with an option. They said, I know that man can heal my friend. Come on, we go. Hit him up on my show. Let's go. Let's go. Are you that type of friend? I hope I'm that type of friend. I try to be. That just when I met with an obstacle, I don't just say, oh, well, that's the end of it. Use another sports analogy. Man, we're down about 20 points, man. We're not going to win this game. <laughs> <laughs> that's what every team thinks when they play the Falcons. But they probably say, well, no, we're down by 100, but we can come back. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I'll pray for my father. Y'all do the same. <laughs> we're gonna get, we're gonna win the Super Bowl one day. <laughs> one one day. Hopefully I'm alive. It's gonna keep you this safe. <laughs> <laughs> even if, right? Even if they but they said and let him down through the tilling of the roof just so that we can be before Jesus. Because I believe that if we can just touch him, we'll be good. Because think about this: if they had just gone home. It's so many people. I mean, I'm sure they had a legitimate reason. It's hot. We're not that big. It's not that many of us. He'll understand. I mean, after all, he's been paralyzed his whole life. It's not like we did anything wrong. <laughs> right? Like, he, he, he'll be good. Like, I, I heard one of the Pharisees say he'll be back in a couple weeks. <laughs> so, maybe we can, we can get him in. Uh, nope. So we're not going to allow our fight. We're going to let him in through the roof. We're going to literally set a roof off. <laughs> I mean, listen, I need some ride or dies right here. Verse 20 said, and when he saw their faith, he said unto them. Verse 20 said, and when he saw their faith, he said unto them. My Bible says in verse 20, and when he saw their faith, when he saw his what? Hey. When he saw his what? Hey. Hey. He said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began reasoning to themselves, who is this that can speak these blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus said, why reason in your heart whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven or rise up and walk? And verse 24 says, but that he may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. So he got more than what he even bargained for. He could have got to the hill and went on home, which in and of itself would have been amazing, right? I couldn't walk and now I can walk. I couldn't see, now I can see. Man, listen. Imagine that. You don't have all of your faculty. You don't have all five of your senses. How happy would you be 
if you were paralyzed and now you can walk. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Man, I'll be shh, jump, run, never sitting down. Mm-hmm. Y'all heard about that guy? He running around, he ain't gonna start running, then he's like, damn, just run. <laughs> Listen, like Forrest Gump, just run. <laughs> just running and running and running. Imagine that you can't, you couldn't see your entire existence. And now because of this man, he, he said, put some spit on the ground and put it on your eyes. That's nasty, y'all. Why well, am I going to do that? I don't want to do that. You would, that's what you're thinking, right? I would have been like, man, give me that mud now. <laughs> <laughs> He said, thy son, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. He said, take up your bed and walk. That's amazing. It wouldn't have been a sin for his friends to say, you know what? We're going to just go on home, man. Right? Doesn't mean God was any less capable. Doesn't mean they didn't love their friend any less. But they were proactive. They could have even said, we're going to wait in this line until the line died out. And it wouldn't have been wrong. It wouldn't have been a sin. God wouldn't have been upset with them. But Jesus said, when he saw their faith, that's when he said, you know what? They believe in me. And I imagine this in my mind. I think, and I don't know about you guys, but I try to make the Bible practical and literal, right? And I think to myself, okay, God is looking at Daniel. Is he going to believe? Who is he going to believe? What's Christianity going to I know Glenn said something good, but is he really going to follow through? Mm-hmm. What about Tim? Is Tim, Tim going to really trust? You know what? He is. He believes in me. There he goes, holding my promises. Yep, he had a rough day at work, but there he goes. He believing. He's believing in my word. She's, she's trusting in me. Mm-hmm. They don't look like I want it to look right now. The three Hebrew boys, they talking about throwing me in a fiery furnace. If anyone had a reason to doubt, it was them. Their lives are literally on the line. And like I said, most of us, 99.9% of that, we don't. Our lives aren't. You have a health condition. Are you quoting Isaiah 53, verse 5, God? Things are challenging. All things work together for good. Are we quoting those things? Are Are we believing them? Are we believing? And Jesus here forgives the man of his sin and says, take up your mat and ride. That's amazing. That's proactive faith. That's proactive faith. Now, even if faith, committed faith, and proactive faith. They didn't stop at the first sign of opposition. And sometimes we have to be creative and think outside the box to get things done. Think about it. The very fact that I'm even talking about them right now is an indication that they thought outside the box. True. Jesus said, seeing their faith. Imagine how they felt. Hey, I'm tired, man, but you know what? There he go. He's five feet from there. Hey, he's taking the rest of the way. I took him over. I put him on my shoulders. I got right here. Hey, you taking the rest of the way. I'm going to just sit right here. Y'all go, go. Like a relay race. They were probably handing them off. Keep going. I'm good. Hey, my knee hurt. Hey, go. Just go. Our friend got to be healed. And man, Jesus, hey, hey. He's the real deal. They won't heal. He don't heal. He don't take care of him. And Jesus said, seeing their faith. Jesus, he saw it. They didn't do all that because they didn't believe. You go to the grocery store because you think the grocery store has groceries. <laughs> you go to the bank because the bank has the money. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have faith. You believe. You don't go there thinking something and then want the exact opposite. That defeats the purpose. Right? And that's what we see, the proactive thing. So I want to give you guys some practicals. 
some takeaway, right? We heard the word of God. How does it apply? Right? The first thing is, I want you to know, faith is an action word. It requires us to take proactive steps as evidence of our belief in God. Right? In the book of James, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, faith without works is dead. Right. Taking the necessary steps, being diligent, doing what is necessary so that you can prepare for God's blessing. Right? If you want to get in certain physical shape, are you going to the gym? Are you preparing for it? Are you have certain financial and savings goals? Are you putting aside extra every paycheck? Are you prepared? Have you had the faith? You want to go on a trip this summer? Are you preparing for it now? All right? June, July is only a couple months away. It'll be here before you know it. Right? Are you taking necessary steps as evidence of your faith? Are you taking God at his word? Little girl in the story. She said, Dad, I heard what you said this morning. You told mom that we can get through this, we can get through anything. Do we take God at his word? I have, I have three brothers. My dad, he would, when we were younger, I must have been about five, maybe four or five weeks. My dad would, uh, he would come downstairs and he would wrestle with us. We have a big living room with my parents' house. He would just wrestle with us. And he would do it on Sunday, Sunday nights. And we would be ready. We're ready for him. <laughs> we about to take him. <laughs> We're downstairs waiting. My mom like, why are you going downstairs? The boy down there, they wait. We, 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 listen, we, we, not, we ain't hearing nothing else. It's time to wrestle with dad. <laughs> we getting ready, changing our clothes. We ready. Because we're preparing. We know he's going to come downstairs and we're going to wrestle. I'm going to try to get him in the headlock. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed to always give us. But nonetheless, we have faith. Yeah, we, we were preparing. Are they coming down a little bit? Yeah, we're going to be ready. Yeah, you get them on that side, baby. You get them this side. Whatever the case may be, apply it to your daily life. So faith is an action word. Number two, have childlike faith in the promises of God. Have childlike faith in the promises of God. Jesus said that unless you become like one of these children, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that? Because he recognized that children, as innocent as they are, they don't question. They just do what the, the parents tell them to do. When I was younger, I did what my parents told me. I'm sure you did the same thing. Mom says, eat this. Okay. I didn't think, well, I'm going to send this. Is she trying to drug me? Is she trying to do this? Are they trying to get over on me? Even to this day, my mom gives me, okay. It's good. My mom says, taste this. Okay. All right. Right? Because you trust. You don't think twice about it. The same way you sit down in that chair. You don't think twice about it. I know the chair going to hold it. It's the same principle. It's childlike faith. I think the only reason why you're saying that is because she's on the line. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> Do we have childlike faith? I remember when I was, when I was younger, I, I didn't think, I used to think that there were no bad people in the world. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Lo and behold, I found out that's not the case. <laughs> Some of them I represent in court. But nonetheless, <laughs> I used to think, oh, why? Because I, I didn't know any better. You didn't know anything. I thought, oh, everybody's good. Everybody goes to church. Everybody's not going to lie still. Because, why? Childlike faith. You don't question. You just do. And that's really how God wants us to be. Well, he, doesn't, he doesn't want us to question. Just do it. Just do what I said. Hey, you didn't do it? Okay, do it this time. You made a mistake last time? That's fine. Do it this time. All is not lawful. He wants us to have childlike faith. And number three, don't limit God. Number three, don't limit God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says that God is able to do more than I can ask or imagine. He's able. He's able. He's able. <laughs> we were in sync on that, Glenn, when I texted you. 
right? Because often, oftentimes we think that everything there is to know about a situation is all there is to know. I don't see a way out. Hmm. Why? Because you have a micro level perspective. God has a macro level. All right? Don't be fooled into believing that everything there is to know about a situation, you know it already. That's why sometimes people depart from faith. Well, I don't understand why this happened. Therefore, I'm done. If God was good, why would he allow that to happen? Everything there is to know about it, you know about it. I was talking to one of my college professors, he was an atheist. And I was asking him a question. And I was like, well, how are you so certain that God doesn't exist? I grew up in church, and so I'm thinking to myself, and you get to college, you should be real out there. Everybody thinks a Christian, right? Okay, fine. Even though they may believe in, in a different faith, but to say there's no God, you can definitively make a 100% certain statement that there's no God. That doesn't, doesn't fly. Well, I asked him questions like, well, is there a moral law? And then is there a moral law giver? And these fundamental questions lead to God. Who's to say it's wrong for me to pull the trigger right now? I mean, after all, me and you, we're on the same level. So you and human being just like me. No, it's wrong because God says it's wrong. Thou shalt not kill. A lot of people are being stooped and, and, and believe fables and lies, and it's taking them away. The war of attrition. The numbers, unfortunately, are rising because people are not keeping the faith. They limit God. I even do it sometimes. I have to catch myself. I set my goals higher than what I think. Whatever my first thought is, no, I want it higher. I want it higher. Why? Because that first one, that's the limit. After that, yeah, that's, that's where it is. Right? Because you're thinking, oh, well, this is all I can do. God can do more. Doesn't that what the Bible says? They can do more than we can ask or imagine. Think about that. The human mind can imagine a lot. It can think a lot. But the Bible says God can do even more than that. So it is possible the Falcons can win the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't limit God. <laughs> but think about that. Think about how that applies to your daily life. I'm not going to limit him. I'm not going to. I'm not going to constrain myself to the belief. I may not know everything, a single thing about the situation, but God, open my eyes, help me to see it. Pray about it. Ask God to show you a, a different way. He can open your mind to different things. He can show you an alternative way to solve a problem. On your job, you may be the only believer. You may be someone that can encourage a coworker. I never forget, I was, I was, I was doing Bible study when I was in college. I'm like, one or two teammates would show up. And I was like, okay. And then one time I came, it was like one, it was me and him. And I was like, you know what, just, just go, just keep, keep going. And then, you know, four or five of them came in. They were, and I, if I had stopped, then they would have been long gone. They would have came, but because they weren't from Atlanta, they were like, hey, you ain't nowhere to go to church. You know, DB, he always, you know, he's about to say something. He just catches them. Don't limit God. Just keep going, hey. Be proactive, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, ask God for more faith. If you feel like you're lacking in faith, if you feel like it's a situation where you don't know because you don't have enough faith, ask them. The disciples did. In Luke chapter 17, they asked Christ for more faith. Lord, give us more faith. Some situations require more faith. Every situation and circumstance isn't necessarily the same. Some situations may require a little bit more faith in it. And that's okay. Let's 
it there. If you would, please turn to Luke, to Luke chapter 17, verse 5. And when you get there, say, he said it's the last verse. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 5 said, and the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Again, you don't ask something of someone unless you believe they can do it. I used to go to my parents, ask them for money. Lord knows I used to go to them ask them. Because I thought they had it. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> and they asked God the same thing. Increase our faith. Lord, help our faith. No, Lord, today wasn't a good day, but you know what? This is all. Help me have more faith tomorrow. It's okay if you, if you, if you may be listening and think, okay, well, I haven't had the greatest faith. I'm still developing my faith. That's okay. That's all right. Keep trying to improve. Keep getting there. Don't quit. Don't give up. That's what Buster Douglas did against Mike Tyson. He didn't give up. Not only did he last to the end, he won the fight. They knocked him out. Outlast him. Outlast him. You can never win a race that you quit. I know that it's challenging sometimes. We've all had challenges and obstacles where you want to give up. You do not quit. Call someone, reach out. Don't go through it alone. That's all the enemy wants you to do is be in isolation. God is infinite. And we're finite. And it may feel like God is giving you more than you can deal with. I've been there. Okay, Lord, I know you got a lot of faith in I think God has more faith in us sometimes than we have in him. All right, God, that's enough. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. That's enough. Right? Ask God for more faith. He'll give it to you. Be the one that starts that faith in your family. Be the one that says, you know what? From here on out, we're, we're marked. We mark that group. Okay. Verse 6, and the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be, up, be uprooted and be cast into the sea, and it shall obey you. A mustard seed is extremely small. So if you have faith, even slightly bigger than a mustard seed, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. So I want to encourage you all. Please understand that faith is a foundational element in our relationship with Christ. And we know that God even requires it as he, he requires it from us as we come to him. And sometimes faith requires us to be patient and long-suffering. And sometimes it requires us to be committed. Sometimes we have to have proactive faith. Other times we have to have even if faith. But as long as you have faith. When those obstacles and challenges are presented before you, know that this is the time that you must exercise your faith in the gym called life. Amen.